an attribution from an agency running traffic for an e-commerce product, you you almost want like the uh, closed like uh, lane. So it's like people are going to go and buy this product. If they don't, we'll remarket them and retarget them. Um, so there's like a, and, and you can have like bumps and um, kind of bundle offers and things like that, or um, upsells and things, of course. But um, if it's got that sole focus of here's the products you're selling, it does make your life a lot easier. And um, so, yeah, so I think that that's a really, really powerful way of going, especially if your traffic is naturally going to YouTube. I am here with the legend Tom Breeze. Uh, I am very excited for today's podcast. Uh, Tom is the CEO and founder of Viewability. Uh, which is one of the world's largest spenders on YouTube ads. That was some of the biggest feedback we had from our US adventures was people wanted to know more about how to use YouTube in their uh, lead gen info and e-com campaigns. And that's what we're here to, uh, to discuss. Tom is, of course, one of our headlining speakers, one of the speakers I'm most excited about at uh, this year's Facebook and e-commerce Mastery Live in Barcelona, July 10th and 11th. Uh, you can grab your tickets through this special ad buyers link uh, right now. Uh, we uh, Ticket prices just went up. They'll be going up again basically every week now from here on out. So you've got to make sure you join us in Barcelona. It is going to be a, a, an amazing adventure like all of these events are. You're going to get a taste today of uh, what Tom is bringing to the table. Welcome to the Robust Marketer today. Tom, how you doing? I'm very good, Eric. Yeah, how are things? Very well. I'm I'm very excited. Summer is, is in full swing. Or well, er, spring is in full swing here in Victoria. <laughs> nice. uh, I've got a cricket. I've got our our, our top rivals in our cri on my cricket team. We're playing on Friday, uh, <laughs> yeah. and I'm here, I'm one of the few Canadians who plays cricket, and I love to work it into my podcast whenever possible. <laughs> Great. Uh, you must but, be like the like, m very few podcasts out there talk about cricket, which is like very few, amazing. Very few Canadians. Just very, <laughs> very few very Canadians very, in yeah, general. Yeah, well, I am sure. the token Canadian on my team. Um, but I'm doing great. I, 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 you know, I first sort of started reading about you. You've done such a good job, something that Russell Brunson talks about all the time of specializing. And we'll mm -hmm. get into that a little bit about how you've sort of built your funnel for your agency is something I'm really interested in discussing as well. Uh, but let's start with your hero's journey. Talk about how you got started and, and, and where you are today and, and what brought you. Yeah. So, um, the, I suppose where it kind of a lot of this angle of where I got into the video space was I finished up at university having studied like three years of psychology and absolutely fell in love with the topic. I just, like, as soon I went there kind of not really knowing what I wanted to do, wanting to go to university. And I was like, okay, I've got some knowledge behind me, but I didn't, I didn't choose a course until I thought, do you know what? Like I have to do something and psychology is broad enough to cover most things and I'll get out of university with, with a degree and I'll go from there. Um, so it wasn't like a conscious choice to go for psychology, but I'm so glad I did because I absolutely loved it. Um, I was like one of those students that actually loved going to lectures and just like absorbing information, just learning and things. Um, and after my three years of doing psychology there, I wanted to do my master's in psychology and was applying a lot, a lot of that like learning now to working with people. And I specialized in the sport uh, arena to begin with, working with golfers, uh, working, with, working with hockey players. Unfortunately, I didn't work with any cricket players. Um, but um, it's those sorts of like disciplines of understanding how people uh, will unconsciously learn kind of um, strategies to play sport at the very best of their ability. But then you unpick it and you can understand how they're doing that. And then you can learn from that and apply it to other uh, disciplines. And so I got really into the sport world and it didn't really pay that well. So I was living in London at the time, I'm a Brit. Um, and, uh, these, um, and when I had all these skills and I'd learned like things like neuro-linguistic programming, hypnotherapy, time on therapy, that these like amazing approaches. And I think people have connotations around all these different types of disciplines. There's some amazing stuff in all the different disciplines, but sometimes they're practiced in the wrong ways. I like to try and be very ethical about the way we do things. Um, but the, I remember, um, kind of working with a lot of golfers, a lot of, um, people in London. Um, but the, the thing about London was that there were so many people in London who were in the business world who, and the people that I could really help were people who have confidence issues and anxiety related issues. That was like my area of expertise. And so a lot of people come to me for this anxiety related issue around public speaking. So I used to work with people one-to-one -one for public speaking anxiety. 
And I'll just pick up a few clients here and there, but my business wasn't really going that well. It was a classic kind of psychologists starting out, like not having a clue how to build their practice. And it's like, I've got one client or zero clients, but I'll brag about the fact that my dad came to my clinic once or something like that. Um, and I, so I, I started advertising as best I could in different ways. I did like yellow pages, tried to be in phone directories, that type of thing. This is quite a while ago. Um, and the a kind of a leaflet came through my door, which was uh, 30 pounds, which is about 45 US dollars of um, ad spend on Google AdWords. And this was in the good old days where Google AdWords were just kind of starting out really. And um, so I, was like, I had a look at it. I was like, well, I might as well like, apply this. I spent about 6,000 US dollars on uh, trying to get yellow pages to work and I got no phone calls whatsoever. And uh, so I was like, well, that was a complete waste of money. And then I kind of used this 30 pounds um, opportunity. And it was really simple at the time. It was just pure search, text-based ads that were running on Google. Ran it and I said, right, if anyone types in fear of public speaking, I was right at the top of the search results uh, with my ad there. I was like, okay, that was simple. And um, I spent 30 pounds that day and I got two clients uh, that kind of contacted me on my website and booked in. Um, and it was like um, 240 pounds each. So it was 480 pounds from a 30 pounds investment. I was like, this is this is where it is. This is like the answer, basically. Yeah. And um, so I just kept on repeating that process, not spending a huge amount. I didn't need to because that was all I could really do in terms of seeing clients. But I'd help people with this public speaking fear. And things were going really well. My diary was booked out. And I was like, this is amazing. But it was just me, just just me by myself doing my, doing my thing, so to speak. And um, I was trying to leverage how I do things. And so I ended up putting a video on my website so when I ran my traffic to my site, now it have a video and a contact form. There was no funnel in place or anything like that. But it took me about, I remember, because I used to, when I filmed it, I had to borrow my cat, my uh, my parents' camcorder, and I had a dictaphone in my pocket where I had like a lapel mic going down into it. And then I had to sync it all up afterwards. And I used to press um, start record and stop record on my dictaphone to know how many takes I'd done. And I was well into like 150 takes of this video trying to get it right. I'd run out of battery so many times on the camera and all, <laughs> all these like mistakes I was making. But ended up getting my video done, put it on my website, and my conversion rate went from 7% to 22% overnight. Same ad spend, just three times as many people contacting me. And I was like, there must be something in this video space. Like I didn't really love advertising yet, um, but I love the idea of like this conversion rate just massively improving from video and so I used to, all these people that come to me for public speaking training a lot of them end up coming to me saying how do i do videos because i'm required to do some videos either for my internal meetings or i'm required to do video for my own website for the business owner so i started teaching people how to do videos and helping them present on camera and uh that's where i kind of fell in love with that whole approach of saying hey you can actually create a really cool video and put it on your website and people were getting great conversion rates and great sales uh, because it was just it was new, it was different, and I managed to crack the code on that, and it worked really, really well. And the so I started doing a lot more videos of businesses, and then I got into the SEO world. So once we started creating these videos and putting them on YouTube and looking to see how we can get more exposure, one of the things was SEO. Like, can we get backlinks? Can we create more videos? Can we do a load of stuff there? And I teamed up with um, like a partner to help up, like help us grow the SEO, and that company like scaled really, really quickly because we were getting great results with SEO for YouTube, kind of ranking on the top of uh, YouTube, but also the top of Google for some really big keywords, keywords worldwide. And um, I was like, this is going great. Everything was working really nicely until um, Panda updates, Penguin updates, Hummingbird updates, all just changed the whole game of SEO. And uh, so all these results started like disappearing. Clients weren't very happy. There was nothing I could do about it. We had like 20 odd people in the team doing all this SEO work that wasn't really being effective any longer. And just out of sheer panic, um, because one of my clients I was really close with has helped me build my business to begin with. I um, I took his video, and um, as which was an SEO video that drops from the rankings, and I ran it as an ad. And I didn't even know anything about YouTube ads. It was like brand new. Um, and um, the ad that I ran for this client just kind of just worked incredibly well. The lead cost was so cheap. It was a good video. And when I look back now, a lot of the stuff I know now is kind of almost based off that first experience. But uh, the 
the ad works extremely well. We were able to scale it a lot faster, but without, without having all these overheads of staff and everything else that was um, a bit of a bit of panicky at the time, and it saved the business. Um, but because I was so nervous about kind of getting the result for the client, I spent my own money on the ad spend to try and just drive leads. And luckily, they converted ridiculously well, and we just kept on growing and scaling their account. But I never took my ad spend. It was like I funded the ads all the way through, and that's how I built the agency. So now with all of our clients we work with now, I fund the advertising, they pay for results, and it just sets things up in the right way. So I kind of fell into the ads agency world almost by just doing a good job, I suppose, and just ended up getting the, getting our clients. Um, but um, it means we've set things up slightly differently, and I love doing it that way because it feels like I'm in partnership with every one of my clients. We have a really close yeah. relationship as opposed to being a traditional agency being paid on a monthly fee or a percentage of ad spend. So yeah, that's kind of like how I got into what I do today. And um, and then I just focus purely on YouTube. Uh, I don't do any other forms of advertising. Just YouTube is my thing. And uh, I still feel like I'm learning so much every single day with YouTube. So <laughs> I've got plenty to still explore on YouTube. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, I think it's super interesting. So, uh, you know, when you decided to specialize, you were able to, to basically r really find some some scale with this. Give us an idea of where you're at with your agency today. Like what what sort of level of clients are you working with? How many, like, how have you scaled the agency? Like how many people are on your team now? So we've, we've kind of scaled up and pared down a little bit just to kind of get like a, a really good team together. Um, I found like the, the agency growth, we're kind of 11 members of staff now working purely on client campaigns. We've got some freelance people helping out in different ways as well, but like the internal team here in the office, um, and a few people that work remotely, we have like 11 of us. So it's not a huge, huge agency. It's not like we've got 100 employees or anything like that. Um, the the structure we have with clients, like typical client would be spending around about anywhere between 50 and $100,000 a month on, um, on ad spend. Um, we have some that are far, far bigger than that and some that are kind of less than that, but that would be typical range, I would have thought. And um, the... Uh, and then we have like consultancy clients as well. So we're kind of like a lot of our big clients will be spending a lot of money where we'll oversee and help them strategize and work out the best ways to get YouTube ads to work uh, most effectively for them as well. So we have a, um, I mean, 90% of our stuff is on the agency side. We have a bit of consultancy that's, that's currently building and growing as well. Um, I'm not sure how many clients we've got live right now. I kind of, I tend to lose count sometimes. <laughs> um, there's a lot. <laughs> it's probably, I think it's probably about 30 or 40 nice. live right now uh, that we're working with. Um, and um, and yeah, like, like I've got to say, like it, it sounds like it's all me. It's definitely not all me. It's it's the client. It's the um, it's the team that I've um, that I work with on a daily basis that handle ninety five percent of it, and uh, they're ridiculously good. So yeah, but it's yeah, but it's come from your vision, and I bet a lot of it. Like I, I want to actually talk about your. I want to get into YouTube at some point. We'll get there soon. <laughs> but I want to talk about your agency funnel and you know, putting the book on top of it, becoming such a specialized authority in one thing, I think is such a smart move for anyone who's who's considering info. So let's get in, so that'll be my hook to the end. So we'll, we'll get to that later. Uh, cool. But let's talk about YouTube now. Let's talk about the essential, um, you know, aspect of YouTube advertising that's different. You know, most of the people that, that, that we work with are, are, are pounding the Facebook ads, this interrupted mm -hmm. style of in-stream advertising. Let's talk a little bit about the essential philosophy of YouTube ads or what you brought to the table. Yeah, okay, good question. I think that um, the, Whenever people look at YouTube, it's normally a new platform for them. So it's it's either they've explored it and most fail when they first start out with YouTube because it's a different platform that takes a different mindset somewhat. Um, I used to a lot of face. I used to do a lot of Facebook advertising. I don't do any at all now. But um, when we used to do it, I used to feel like it was almost like a, I needed a fifteen minute break from looking at a Facebook ad campaign and then getting to a YouTube ad campaign just because it's almost like a different language. You're doing the same thing. You're promoting products to similar people, but it's a very, very different discipline. So you look at someone like Facebook, which is a big, I know that um, like the, most people will be listening in or probably be Facebook heavy. Um, Facebook is the sort of platform where you're all vying to get into the newsfeed and it's going to be based mainly off either warm traffic, like retargeting options and things, or people, people based on their interests or people that are part of the algorithm, like lookalike audiences and things. Um, and it's that interest-based targeting when you're looking for cold audiences that means that you have to do certain things in a certain way. So you're targeting people, their mindset is normally where they're, they're interested, but they're not necessarily looking for what it is you have. Um, and also because you're uh, getting in front of them on their newsfeed, 
you almost need, need to do quite a bit of grabbing their attention to begin with. But then you look at the video itself. If you're running a video ad on Facebook, you also have a lot of text around it. So you can you can have a really interesting video. And if people lose interest for a second, they might go and read the rest of the post that goes with that video. So you've got a few benefits um, and great options available with Facebook. You also have things like retargeting that's ridiculously powerful on Facebook based on viewer uh, retention as well. So if someone watches like 50, 75, 95% of your video or completes the video, you have those audiences ready for you to retarget them as well. So there's all those options available to you, but it is that interest-based audience. Whereas yeah. with YouTube, it's a very different audience. People normally go into YouTube for, an in, for a reason. They're going there because they want to it's normally one of three reasons that we would be most interested in. They want to either know something, they're looking to explore and learn and find out more about a particular topic. They want to um, they, want, they want to do something. So looking up the how-to tutorial style videos, um, like looking for um, instruction and kind of how to do something in particular. Or you have that some people that are going to YouTube because they want to buy something. They, they're looking to see reviews, what other people have to say about it, compare product dimen like models or just watch, watch unboxing videos which is still astounds me how many people watch unboxing videos but that's that's the truth of the matter that's how people behave and when we know that and we know what our audience are going to youtube for and they're not necessarily going there to hang out per se uh we go there with that intent but the session duration on youtube is insanely long so the average session duration on youtube is 40 minutes which i think is crazy no way that is crazy yeah that is a lot right um and I, I feel like, okay, there's going to be some people that are at 10 minutes, for example. Yeah. But that also means that there's going to be some people there at two hours, three hours. And I'm guilty of this myself. I'll go on to YouTube for one reason. And I'll Joe go Rogan to... raises the bar so much on all that. <laughs> yeah, probably, right? so Joe, Joe Rogan is that person that's just like that viewer attention. And three that hours every duration. time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Life, yeah. And, and you all of a sudden are learning about some really, really specific health issue that doesn't even concern you, but it's like, I now know everything about this weird synapse <laughs> in my brain or something. Um, but the but that's like what YouTube does. And if it's good engaging content, we stick around and we watch. And But it's people have time as well when I go to YouTube. So I, I pick up my phone and I'll go to Facebook and I'll scroll through and see if anyone's mentioning something or if anyone's connecting with me or if just go and see what's like to basically get distracted or see what my community's up to. Whereas when I'm on YouTube, I'm not there for that reason. I'm there because I want to learn and I want to discover and I want to explore. I want to know how to do something or want to potentially buy something. I want to review products. I want to. And so with that in mind, you've got this, these people that are full of intent. So the way I describe it is almost like you're getting in front of window shoppers on Facebook, mm. but with YouTube, you're getting in front of people that have already come into the store and are asking people questions and want to know things. Um, and so you don't need to do this huge amount of, um, grabbing attention with your video ads at all you the attention's already there it's just more a case of like turning up at the right time with the right message and connecting with that audience and give them a great experience and if you can do that you'll find that you really really connect with people at a level that is unbelievable because most people compare youtube to like tv for example where there's no engagement whatsoever um but you can have this connection where it's tv like so they look at if you're advertising on youtube they think that you're like a tv brand which really helps they're like oh wow you really must be doing well because you're advertising on youtube which is weird um and then but then it's not as it's it's more kind of a, a place of uh, people want that kind of information so if you can provide that value to them they will be indebted to you immediately psychologically because they're thinking well that was amazingly cool where do I go next? What do I have to find out? Like, if you set them up in the right way, you tend to get ridiculously good conversion rates as well. That's yeah. So, so you basically set them up by by this. This is such an interesting thing because I'm a YouTube fanatic. I'm on YouTube all the time. I, I'm watch. I'm listening to YouTube in the evenings, kind of thing. Sometimes I'm suddenly while I'm washing dishes or something. Uh, and I'm, I'm trying to think about the targeting now because I'm. Mo I'll, I'll come out and say this. I'm mostly watching like weird like. Egypt, videos about Egypt and like p political things and conspiracy yep. things. And, but the only ads that I get are, are for me being, uh, for our info products are, mm -hmm. are people, you know, and, and I'm, and I'm wondering if that's because it's cause I'm kind of searching for something in the kind of videos I'm looking for. So it's like, that's like a personality type in a way that I'm a searcher. So then therefore I'm likely to be searching for ways to make money online or, 
or, or things like that. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the targeting on, on these ads. Like, what do you find most useful? Are you, are you mostly prospecting from, similar with Facebook, you're prospecting on interests and moving to remarketing, moving to sequencing? Like, what, what is your sort of mix when it comes to a successful campaign? This is, yeah, so it's, it's a good um, insight, actually, because I think that there's some advertisers out there that, especially people with a Google background, like if they're used to the Google platform or Facebook, they tend to go that route that you just said, like go for interest-based targeting first and then find new audiences as, as they go. I do almost like the opposite way around. I start with like the um, the lowest hanging fruit, get that dialed in, and then based on the more and more data that comes through, I then start to explore the bigger audiences because I can get Google to help me out with the more AI machine learning type campaigns. So um, I don't actually touch remarket until much, much later. Um, which is unlike most, because most people feel like YouTube ads is just good for remarketing, which is funny to me because I find remarketing sometimes the hardest campaigns to get right, <laughs> which is interesting. Um, the Because it, 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 it's done in a slightly different way. So the way that I do it to begin with is I normally start with keyword targeting. So I'll be like, what are people typing in? Where are they going? And the way that keyword targeting works on YouTube is different to Google, for example, because Google, people go to the search bar, type something in, click on a website, go back to Google, refine their search, click on a link, go back to Google, kind of go back and forth with google.com or wherever the location is there. Whereas with YouTube, that doesn't happen. Sometimes with YouTube, you, you might use a search bar. You probably didn't even get there. You might have clicked through from another video on a blog or on Facebook or something and you got through to YouTube. Um, or you may have typed in the search bar once, but then you start watching a video, then you watch another video, then you watch another video. then you And so you're, you're staying on youtube.com, so you're not leaving the platform, but you're not really going back to the search bar. So it is the second largest search engine in the world, but it's not used really that much. <laughs> it's just a, it's considered a search engine and it's just a very, very popular, but it doesn't mean the two things are connected so much. Compared so way, to its use also, right? Like you're going to YouTube, you're going to the Google search portal to search every single time you go there. Whereas you're spending, like you say, two hours at a time, sometimes without ever searching, except for maybe your first. Exactly. Yeah. So that's why the keyword data on Google is amazing. The keyword data on YouTube is a bit sketchy, um, but that works to our advantage in a way, because the way that keyword targeting works, is almost like if you were to type in a keyword into the search bar or watch videos of certain content and the, the keyword might be in the title or description or tags, um, it means that during that session, that 40 minute window, I can run an ad to you. It doesn't have to be right there and then when you're watching that video, but it could be five, 10 minutes later. Um, and that gives us, gives us um, a weird um, scenario. So it means that I can get in front of you during your session, which is great because it means it doesn't have to be right now. It can be later, which means the cost can be a little bit less because you might end up watching your Egypt videos, but then end up watching Justin Bieber or something. Um, I'm not sure if that's usually. your thing. <laughs> yeah, usually. Yeah, exactly. He's Canadian, so I have to, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's your, it's your duty. Um, and then, um, so it means that, I'm, it might have cost me a fortune to advertise to you when you're looking up Egypt stuff. That'd be weird, but you know, I'm sure you're getting where I'm going with this. Yeah, totally. um, but then with Justin Bieber, it'd be like super cheap. And so it means that I can still get my message in front of you, mm. but where it's cheaper. And um, so that's interesting. But the other thing about that is that sometimes I don't want it to be cheaper. So I, want, I almost wish the algorithm works in such a way where I could say, I don't want it to be my maximum cost per view that I bid on. I want it to be my minimum cost per view that I bid on. I don't, I don't want to spend too low because otherwise I can turn up in, um, in front of you, but when it's not the perfect time to get in front of you. Um, so it's a really weird, um, I'm probably going too deep, too quick on this subject, but it's, it's an interesting uh, balance sometimes where you're saying, I want to get in front of the perfect traffic. So you sometimes have to spend a little bit more to do that, but then you get in front of the, the real people. It's, I'm sure the ha same thing happens with Facebook where you know that um, a bit like you can spend more in order to get in front of the best type of traffic sometimes and yeah. it might cost more but you get better results with them it's really interesting it's like it's like these platforms know more about our you know our behavior than we do in a way it's sort of like it's like you can sort of sense momentum in a way like if you're going to make a purchase on something you're more likely to make it when you're in the momentum of a bunch of relevantly themed videos than you might when you're off watching and you know a conspiracy video or something like that uh, and yeah. so therefore those are going to be so much more valuable because they they have this momentum sort of with them the momentum towards conversion maybe yeah exactly That's, yeah uh, so it, you get this like it's an odd like it's, there's a few variables to balance which is why youtube's harder i think because you've got the video you've got the targeting and then you've got the costs involved with that 
Um, and so there's a few variables that you're you're um, you're juggling. Whereas like with Facebook, it can sometimes feel a little bit easier because some of that's handled for you already. Um, but the so with YouTube, you'll obviously get in front of people and that that video gets in front of people like a pre-roll ad or a discovery ad. The pre-roll ad is the one which I'm sure we're all used to where it's like you have to wait for five seconds before you can press the skip ad button. Um, and the discovery on ads are the ones where you see at the top of the search results, like the sponsored listing or the right hand side when you're watching a video, those are the discovery ads. Mm. Um, so the, the ways you can get those ads in front of people is you do it with keyword targeting. You can do placement targeting, which is where you say, I want to get in front of like, and you choose the videos you want your ad to run in front of. That can be really cool because um, you get very, very specific there. All the channels, like if you wanted to run your ad in front of all the Joe Rogan videos out there, you could choose Joe Rogan's channel and then run ads uh, to his channel. So it means that anyone who watches any video from his channel, they're probably likely to see your ad. And um, those are kind of like great starting places to, to, to get some momentum going. Um, but then you have topics. So Google will categorize loads of different videos into certain topics. And if those topics are relevant to your audience, it's great to go and explore those. You could do in-market, which is where based on your last seven to 14 days worth of um, search history, if they know that you're in the market for something, you'll fall into categories and I can run my ads to you should you come to uh, YouTube. So that could be because um, YouTube traffic is borrowing off Google's data as well. So if you've got anything on Google happening, it's, it applies to YouTube as well. So you've got a wealth of data um, that's at your fingertips. Um, so in markets are really clever. Custom intent is really cool. So you can build your Ooh. own audiences um, based off Google search history and YouTube search history. So if you, in the last few days, you've been typing certain things in, you'll fall into my custom intent audience that I've built and um, I can run um, ads to you. And um, then you start getting to the bigger audiences like affinity audiences and custom affinity audiences. Um, so some are predefined and Google have those ones. And then you have custom affinity audiences, which I think are almost like the future, but I'm, I'm yet to really crack them to feel confident about training people on them, but like customer affinity audiences, you build your own audiences um, and you choose what sort of audiences you want to build based on, could be interests. So you just type in interests um, that you want people to be kind of potentially interested in. Uh, URLs, so it could be the websites people are visiting. Apps on people's phones. So if you know that um, your audience tend to have a certain app on their phone, you can get in front of all that audience. And also places. So if you're going to places like golf clubs or spas, you can build audiences of those types of people as well. And so you can get loads of really clever audiences together that could be very, very powerful. But I tend to tackle those ones once I'm getting some good traction in my accounts and get good history and good data, because uh, that'll I can then start using some of the more machine learning um, that Google have. And then I can say, I, I want to acquire leads or sales for this price. And then Google yeah. help you out with achieving that result. Very interesting. Okay, so now there's, I want to back up a little bit and talk about the kinds of advertisers, which kinds of advertisers really need to be thinking of YouTube, of YouTube right now, YouTube ads specifically. So this podcast basically covers, uh, you know, e-com, agency, lead gen, and info. Those are the four areas I see, um, you know, really, really big with our audience. What, what are, what, what's your sort of client mix right now? I, I imagine it's got to be a lot of info and lead gen right now, but I'm also interested in any e-com strategies you might have. Yeah, so um, our model of doing cost per acquisition has, has led itself really nicely for info and lead gen. So mm -hmm. we've got loads of data and history there. And I've, I've always lived in that world, like from my from starting out, like my first That's business right. was getting leads. And so I, I knew it really, really well. Um, and the great thing about that as well is attribution is normally very, very simple with that because they see an ad, they sign up for something. And, mm. and there's a, kind of, it's, it's easy to see how the YouTube ad interacted. Because remember, like, when YouTube is rather like TV, you do have this kind of brand lift with YouTube. So you may find that people see your ad, don't take action or click right then, but then they're like, they remember your brand, especially if you mm. created a really good ad. They're like, that was such a cool ad actually. And they go and Google for you and they so then they find you, so to speak. Um, and so the attribution can be such that they see a YouTube ad, but then end up Googling you and going through a, a, a brand search text ad, for example, on Google. Um, and that happens a lot. So there's that kind of slight attribution thing going on there. But um, the, so I think that, yeah, info and lead gen are very, very powerful for YouTube. And they normally lend themselves to people looking for information, which is what people do on YouTube. They're looking for information yeah. so we can just turn up at the right time. 
Um, e-commerce is one of those areas that we've got some really good results there. I wouldn't say we've knocked it out of the park as well as we have done with lead gen uh, for e-com. But um, if there's, what we like to, if we do get into the e-commerce world, we like to try and get like a single product page um, going with a client. So it's, we don't have the scenario where they, like from a YouTube ad, they hit the website and they go and buy one of thousands of SKUs, for example. Yeah. And that sort of scenario, it's like, we single know it's- product funnels. Yeah, exactly. It, it, it does make life a lot, lot easier from a, again, attribution from an agency running traffic for an e-commerce product. You, you almost want like the uh, closed like uh, lanes. So it's like people are going to go and buy this product. If they don't, we'll remarket them and retarget them. Um, mm -hmm. So there's like a, and, and you can have like bumps and um, kind of bundle offers and things like that or um, upsells and things, of course. But um, if it's got that sole focus of here's the products you're selling, it does make your life a lot easier. And um so yeah, so I think that that's a really, really powerful way of going, especially if your traffic is naturally going to YouTube. Um, if you have to do this interception thing where someone's not looking for your product, but you're getting in front of them and there's a bit of a disconnect, it does make life a lot, lot harder because then you're you're not only educating the, the viewer on your products, but you're also um, getting in front of them when they're not necessarily looking for you. That's a that's, That takes a lot of skill with the, with the creative to get that bit right. Um, so you kind of want to, try and work out exactly where your audience are going and can you intercept them at a time that's relevant for them. Um, so I do a lot of work in the baby ne uh, niche, it's like for mom, new mums and things. And um, we do a lot of information marketing in that area. And we're looking at saying, right, well, we can promote loads of different products uh, with kind of like a, with good econ products and they're related to this uh, industry. And in that space, it's like, the audiences are just sitting there waiting for you because there's, there's so many new mums out there look like desperate for advice and help, but they're desperate for products as well that work mm. in like incredibly well. And there's a product that we bought, my wife and I, we've got two kids third on the way. Um, but when we, I remember our first child, uh, someone else bought us this product called you and the sheep. Um, and um, the, you just press a button on its little paw and it, it glows red and it plays a mu plays music. I don't know what it is about that product, but our kid just fell asleep immediately as soon as we yeah. uh, pressed it. And that is a, I, I mean, it would have been as, I could have easily done a video where it's like screaming kid, press the paw and our, our boy would be asleep in 30 seconds. And it would be amazing just to see this. I, and that would be in the perfect video, like almost user generated content to sell that uh, product. So when the right offer is put in front of you, you're very likely to actually take action depending on where you're at mentally or psychologically uh, in that process because sometimes you're just desperate for answers. And uh, so if you understand where your customer is at, why they'll be going to YouTube in the first place and you can intercept them there that is still relevant, that's a great time to put your product in front of people. I like that. Okay, so let's move into the creative a little bit, talking about how you, you, know, you build uh, you know, YouTube creatives that really work and you've alluded to it in a lot of different ways and you, you hit on it there when you talked about um, you know, approaching someone sort of at the level of, of psychology that they're at right now, rather than it's sort of like with Facebook, you're doing a lot of, you're just hammering people. You're sort of hammering, you know, with like, hey, Jack, you might want this thing. This thing's amazing. This thing could change your life. Like you're really just sort of like you're in that stream and you don't have a lot of their attention. So, so how is it different with YouTube when it comes to the creative? Yeah. So when, when I start out with a new client, um, at, or I'm consulting with somebody, the, the first thing I tend to look at is like status for the viewer. Um, once I work that part out, and I'll dive into that in just a second, I actually have a framework called Educate that I use as like a seven step process to like creating the perfect YouTube ad. Um, and the, uh, so I'll go through both of those processes. So when I start with status, the thing I think about is like, how does that individual see themselves right now like what's their identity how do they see themselves um, what, and what are the emotions that go with that and and also what are their uh, kind of schemas it's often called but it's more a case of what are their um behaviors that they feel they they ought to show so to speak so if like if you are let's go for a parent for example what is a good parent behavior like they may not always exhibit that, but that's how they like to see themselves. Um, they yeah, probably, they like, buy things that will maybe solve problems that they hope will, that, you know, will get solved. Yeah, buy exactly. anything. Yeah, and 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 it's amazing if you watch people's behavior. It's so different to what they perceive them like to what they actually behave like. They 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 think that they behave in a certain way, but they actually behave in a completely different way, and that's completely fine because that's just human nature. 
Um, but it's it's understanding that, like, let's say, for example, you said, uh, here's what a typical mum would experience. Um, and if you were to explain that and it was nearly there, most mums would be like, yeah, that's exactly right. But if you look, they broke down their day to day, it would be completely different to that. Um, it's just that they kind of like they experience that. It's like I heard a great podcast because I went to Disney World with my kids recently. And before I went, they were like, the, the great thing about Disney World, it has this illusion effect where if you would have to have a flip chart as you're going around um, Disney World saying, are you enjoying yourself yet? To the parent, <laughs> it'd be like two out of 10. No, I'm not enjoying myself mm. all the way around Disney World. And then right at the last minute, you put your kids down to, be down to bed and they're like, oh, thanks, daddy. I love today. And immediately, right, right, the whole day was 10 out of 10. I don't know why, but it is. <laughs> yeah. And you just have this like massive um, shift in your in your psychology because of one moment that just changes everything. But like when you're aware of that and you kind of play into that, it works really well. So I normally look at like how does someone identify themselves right now? Who do they think they are, which is really important? Not actually who they actually are, but who they think they are right now. And then also what's their kind of ideal persona or status role where and where they want to be so mm -hmm. um if that sounds that was a little bit more tough to do because it's not like a where they're at right now where do they want to be it's where they want to see themselves be so let's say for example you're selling a coffee machine as an e-commerce product I, I don't know why i've chosen coffee machine but i'll go with it um the it's almost like beforehand you like if you think about the coffee machine itself it's like it probably won't play into a status role just yet but the status they want to have is not to be a great coffee drinker or anything like that. They might see themselves as that potentially, but it's more likely that they want the good coffee machine. So when their parents, uh, when their friends come round for dinner, they can make them a cool coffee and they've got a conversation piece and they've got something to give them. And it's like, they can imagine themselves, the coffee and how like good the coffee is, is an important part of that. But it's really that kind of like, I've made you a coffee. Isn't it great? Like, this is this is who I can be. I can be a great entertainer, so to speak. Mm. I can be someone who puts on a great meal for people. I'm that a might be I'm someone who recognizes what a good cup of coffee is and can reproduce it at home. I'm one yes, of those exactly. people. Yeah. Those, those people that are close to me, I can show them this other side of me that makes me feel significant, perhaps, mm -hmm. um, in some way. So it tends to be something along those, along those lines. And, and I just start there and kind of imagine what that would be like. And obviously the more research you've gotten it, the better, but often clients don't give me that data. You have to pick it, pick it out yourself or take a bit of a gut call sometimes as well. But it's, it's understanding what that product means to somebody. And that product is normally just a vehicle, whether it's information products, whether it's a physical product, it's a vehicle to a, a new kind of status that the person will have about themselves. And that's all we really want sometimes. So a bit of a, improved identity that we'll feel ourselves whether that actually does anything that product is by the by it's kind of like does it serve that purpose of making us feel like a, a different person and a better a better person for us um it's a, it's a really difficult thing to convey sometimes but mm. um it's it's like the actual and this is like because i think about advertising a lot because i always feel like i don't know i'm i'm, I'm not going to win any awards for being the most like the best person on the planet for being an advertiser. You don't tend to win those awards when you're an advertiser. Um, and so you kind of, you try and work out like what you're providing to people, but sometimes the, that feeling of someone buying that product for the first time ever, and that's sometimes the delivery point. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's an interesting conversation that we can go very deep on that, but it's, I always find that fascinating to be like, sometimes I buy, I buy a product and I haven't even consumed it yet, but I've already got what I wanted. Uh, it's like I'm not even there for the I bought the information products I bought the physical products but I really bought it if I get really clear with myself I probably bought it just for the feeling of I bought it I've, I own it now it's mine and I'm good with that now it's part of me and that and honestly you know running an education platform seeing the amount of people who will buy our products and and not engage them uh over time it, it is a really interesting phenomenon for sure but what what is really going on with people who do they really think they are and uh, and what are they doing? So now the question is, how do we convince a hundred more people from the Facebook ad buyers group to come to Barcelona, Spain, to join us on this incredible adventure? Uh, my ads tend to focus on the fact that you're going to get a you know a brand new talk from Tom Breeze teaching you like the tactical in and out steps that you need to you know to master YouTube. You're also going to get the chance to mentor with him during the mentorship hour. Uh, you're going to, and you're going to get to do this with 400 of your other most dedicated peers, uh, in this incredible environment. 
So, and then we, and then we do a lot of remarketing with testimonials about past people saying previous things and, and there, as, but I'm trying to get to that essential, like transformational type thing, which is, which yeah. is that, that feeling of being supported by a community. I think that feeling of, 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 of mastery over, over these platforms that, that, that give you unprecedented leverage into your career that, that other generations have never had. Uh, so it's that mastery, and then it's that feeling of being supported by an incredible community, uh, where when you all get together, magical things just happen. I've just I've witnessed it, you know, a dozen times now. How how, yeah, how is so, that? Yeah, I mean, I think the big transformation that people have from these types of events is that when they're part of that group, they they improve themselves to such a level that they know they're a better advertiser. They know they're a better marketer. They know that they can do things at a high level. They, they, it's, it's almost like a confirmation to be like, yes, I am this good. I realize that now I have the confidence to be this person that is like happy to be a bit more. I'm happy to test a few more things. I'm happy to mm. um, fail a lot more. Like that's probably the best way that I've learned is just try things out and fail a lot of the time. And realize that, ah, okay, cool. I got it wrong because of this reason. I'll, I'll, I'll improve it next time. But yeah. It's that confidence to do that sometimes. And I think that's what these types of events bring is a new sense of confidence in yourself to be like, I can, I'm now at this level. I'm, I'm at an ad buyer level this, at this level, so to speak. And now having been at this event, I'm, I'm up another level. And I've, I'm, I'm with other people at that level as well. I'm no longer the person that I was before at the at this level, I can feel myself improving drastically. And as a result, my life will become much different as well. Because I, I don't know about you, but when I find out something new and I'm like, that's going to change everything because I've just worked out how to get a, like a, so, okay, so I'll give you an example. Like, and I share this from stage and I share many more things from stage as well. But one of the things I found out is if you put a countdown timer at the end of your video, it bumps up click-through rates by, uh, we got 36% bump up. Um, so at the end of the video, it just counts down for five, four, three, two, one, and then the video ends. All, there's no difference to the copy, no difference to the kind of actual video at all, but just that countdown timer at the end improve things. And immediately, as soon as I learned that myself, I was like, that's going to change every single campaign I run from here on in. Like that's going to, all my ad results are going to be better. And yeah. then we've got more, I'll be able to get more reach. I'll be able to get more scale. My clients will be happy with me. And so you learn a bit. Imagine coming to an event where you get to see uh, 20 people speak and you learn like four or five things, but you understand things at a whole new level. Mm -hmm. That's when you kind of see this transformation in yourself to be like, I'm actually a, a different type of ad buyer now. And I'm, I'm, in this, I'm in this elevated level now where things do become easier and you've got a network that you can connect with. And it's, that's why oh, I feel like these events is just so powerful for me. The, that, that echoing effect of having 10 new people who you're going to get intermittent messages from, from Facebook checking in on the things you talked about and holding you accountable in some ways and sort of that that the way that my the network grows from event to event uh is you know is, is just an amazing amazing thing to experience that's super cool so let's there was one other thing i wanted to get to was specifically a little bit about creative itself when mm -hmm. i was uh, I'm, i've been talking a lot with liz herrera who is going to be speaking in uh, barcelona as well an absolute yep weapon when it comes to info marketing uh facebook marketing one of the driving forces behind ty lopez and she you know she only advocates at this point just selfie ads just like get yourself an iphone you know x or whatever it is the, the 4k the 4k camera and just shoot the shit out of yourself talking and doing a bunch of things that these are by far like the most effective kind of ads right now for info specifically but i could imagine for all sorts of different kinds of lead gen essentially is that is that sort of your approach as well or do you do you do different depending on clients budget do you will produce high high end videos or do you, do you stick mostly with the with the iphone stuff i don't do any iphone stuff or Seriously. very rarely do i do any iphone stuff um and we've tested time and time again like straight to camera looking like a really nice video versus um the handheld stuff and there's a, the only place I see value for it is post first impression. So I feel like that first impression on a YouTube ad is more like TV than it is um, Facebook, for example. Like Facebook, a completely different beast. I think that that's kind of, yes, iPhone videos can work incredibly well there. Mm. With YouTube, all the data points at, first impression needs to be like, let me give you an amazing experience of what this is about. And you can only really do talking head in a iPhone video. There's not a huge, you can do a bit of a tour perhaps yeah. or handheld walking around and things, but you're missing out on so much. Uh, my belief is like when, you, when you've when you got like a video, you can do like cuts and you can move to like different places and, and really put like an amazing production together. And that converts ridiculously well, but 
as soon as you've had that first impression to the point at which it was memorable, then you can go and do iPhone videos because I feel like then it's like you're hanging off the first impression of having such a good connection with the viewer at a very professional level. And then when you do become their best buddy by having a handheld camera or in the car, which is a very popular way of doing it as well, that then converts like crazy. But I tend to find like the first kind of, um, if we're going to put that first ad in front of people, I always try and go for high production value at that level, just to connect with people and at a level where it's just like, this is a serious brand talking to you, especially if it's a brand new brand. It's different if it's like you've got a big per personal brand already and people know who you are because that really, really does help. Um, like say, for example, if Tony Robbins came out with a handheld camera video, I'm sure people absolutely love that or Richard Branson or someone like that. But if we didn't know who those people are, we need to almost use the production level as a bit of a quality filter to be like, this is a, this is a good ad. You might as well listen into what I have to say here. Um, and, um, and that's normally the where we see the best results. That is a uh, super, yeah, super valuable. That's really good to hear actually. Um, and I, it is, it is a little bit different. I know, I know that there's so much of that, like, uh, on Facebook when it comes to social proof, for instance, videos of, of like, you know, real people using the products can, can do quite well, I think. But when it comes to YouTube, that's interesting that the, uh, the production value really does make a difference there. Very cool. Mm. Uh, we have a few comments here. Uh, Awen wants to know, is that a road podcaster, Tom? <laughs> yes, it is. Um, nice. Should we just get the model number? Uh, <laughs> it's posted, a road podcaster. In the yeah. Nice. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Josiah wants to know if you have any good ad templates or scripts. Yes. So I didn't actually get around to it. So like um, with the uh, status thing, that's why I start out with get psychologically in the right mind to like know who I'm talking to. And then I go through and I, I educate seven step formula. So yeah, educate is like a, an acronym. So you, the seven steps are the aim of the viewer. Like what are they looking for? If you're doing keyword targeting or placement targeting, we're normally in a good place for that. Um, then um, the D is for difficulty, like what's standing in the way of the user or the viewer getting the result they actually want. Um, sometimes they don't know. So if you can explain it to them in such a way where they're like, actually, that's exactly what the problem is. That's great. Um, sometimes it's not easy to identify exactly what the problem is, but you might like to personify it. So you see with like, um, let's say, for example, with if you're selling a kitchen detergent or a kitchen cleaner or something, then the like saying that you're getting rid of bacteria isn't the greatest sell. Whereas if you, turn, if you turn that bacteria into a, some sort of green monster that can cause other problems and health issues and things like that, um, and then, the, then your cleaner gets rid of that completely, then it's like, ah, okay, cool. It destroys the green monsters, not all the bacteria Latin names, for example, that wouldn't be a great sell. Um, so you can kind of create this monster if you wish during that difficulty stage. The U of Educate is understanding. So let people know that emotionally you get it where they're coming from, like what their problem is. Either you may have experienced it yourself before or you've helped so many people that you know exactly what they go through and just describe that emotion to them. If it's a unique emotion, especially pull on that. Um, in the UK, they've got an, an amazing ad that's coming out that's um, out at the moment that's about debt recovery. And um, it starts out with a you're on the street at, in the middle of the night and um, your camera angle where you're looking is up into this bedroom window. And it's the only bedroom window on the street that's got this, uh, the bedroom light on. And it, you presume it's like late at night, like it looks really, really dark, like dark outside. And then immediately it starts like that. And you're like, I know exactly. It almost tells the story completely already. Like someone's up at the middle of the night worrying about debt or worrying about something. Mm -hmm. They can't sleep. And it explains the problem to a point at which the viewer feels like, Oh, I'm not alone. Other people are having this situ situation as well, which gives them that license to do something about it. Sometimes we feel like we're by ourselves and want to hide the problem. Whereas other people have it. We're like, oh, if other people have got it, I've got, I've got the opportunity to actually do something about this and not feel like I'm alone, um, which is important. So the understanding is an important part of it. The, the C of educate is credibility, build up your credibility, show people that you can actually help them, of course. Um, and if you position yourself as that expert in that credibility section, then when you move on to the A, you better make sure you've got your action plan, which is the A for action plan. So a three-step process is normally really good. If you're selling an e-commerce product, I would recommend doing some sort of demonstration and highlighting, like if it's got a process to making coffee, let's say there'll be like a one, two, three step to make coffee in a really simple way. Um, so it feels like to people, oh, I can do that. That's easy. If it's info products, you might have like some sort of proprietary system or model that you might want to uh, demonstrate to people. So feel, people feel like, oh, if there's only three steps, I can do that. If I'm getting out yeah. of debt in three steps, that seems easy. 
um, not 27 steps or something like that. It just feels hard. Um, and so make it easy for people uh, in the action plan. And then the teach or the T of educate is where you pull out one part of that action plan. Um, it might be a small subsection of one of the three, three parts, but you pull it out and you say, hey, look, you're going to love this. Let me show you something that's really cool. And you kind of unpack that section. It might take 20 seconds to explain it or so or less than that. But to the point at which people say, that is amazing. That's a completely new way of looking at things. I love that. Mm. Or whatever it might be that people, like whenever I speak on stage these days, I'll wait for people to like start scribbling things down on a piece of paper. I'm like, mental note, that's what I'm going to use in my next ad or the teach section. Because <laughs> I know that yeah. that's what people, people find really valuable. And, um, and then the last part is the E, is the uh, exit plan. And at that point, you're saying, here's what to do next. If you pull in a status thing of earlier, the exit plan, I like to bridge it with the thing of like saying, if you're expecting to be this new level of like status, like what you want to be, who you want to be as a result of like, I want to be a, a better entertainer because of this coffee machine or something like that, then tie that in with the new statuses, um, expectations of behavior. So if you're that type of person, you will act in a certain way. Because the biggest message in marketing normally, the best mantra is people like us do things like this. And if you can encourage people to become like us, they'll do things like this. So if they know, like, let's say, for example, we're coming to the Barcelona event. If they know that, like, the top marketers and advertisers in the world um, are, uh, are people like this and they behave like this, they know to take action quickly. They know to see where an opportunity lies and they just go for it because they know they need to take advantage of it as soon as possible. Then you need to kind of try and pull that into your call to action as well. So you say people like this or people like us do things like this. You don't want to say that obviously, but if you subtly mention that and pull it back into the status, it's inevitable that they'll take the action because that's the action that's um, congruent with the person they want to become. And that just it. heightens everything. And how, so people like us go to Barcelona and come to Facebook and e-commerce mastery life. How long is that video? How long are like, what does it, does it vary? I, it's funny. Like all the, all these videos that come on during my, my other, my other videos, the info videos, sometimes they're 15, 20 minutes long. Like what, what's your recommendation for length on that sort of video that you just described? Yeah. So with direct response straight add to um, site is it funny enough, like we've been doing a lot of uh, split testing on ad length really difficult to do that because as soon as you include more length you've included more content so you're it's a difficult thing to test like individually uh, without kind of um having a multivariate test with um with split testing time we've looked more at trends of data to see like what have our best ads been and how long have they been it's a minute and 20 exactly that came out with um so a minute minute 20 of content uh, is the best way to do it if that content follows the educate formula. So all of our ads normally fo follow that formula, but it does depend on the strategy as well. So if it's, if it's direct ad to site to take action, one minute 20 seems to perform the best. If it's a slightly different strategy, and let's say for example, you, so one of our best performing ads we've ever done is where at the end of the video, we don't actually do a call to action. What we do instead is we ask the viewer to take a choice of A or B. So it's in the guitar tuition space. And um, at the end of the video, we say, hey, look, we can definitely help you play much better guitar, but just let us know where you're at right now. Are you someone who's in a rut or are you a complete newbie to guitar? You choose and we can give you exact bespoke training. And so these two options come up on the video. You decide where you go next. And it's a easier click to go with because you're just like, mm -hmm. okay, well, actually I get to choose and I wonder what's going to happen next anyway. And that next video you watch is like complete bespoke training based on what you've just clicked. And then off the back of that, you have a link going to the site. So it's a so that's kind of like the timing of that is irrelevant at that point because all we want is to have a, like an amazing experience for people. So like because the comments we get onto that video are like this is the best ad I've ever clicked on. This is the first time I've ever clicked on a YouTube ad and um, and all this sort of stuff. And uh, it's amazing the actual connection you have with people when you give them a great experience. And so sometimes when you have a strategy like that, then it doesn't really matter about the timing. It's more a case of like delivering something amazing so people remember you because then all your re remarketing efforts become so much more powerful as well. But um, yeah, the it, if you're doing a straight ad, direct response straight to the site to get people to sign up to something, a minute 20 tends to be the best time. And in that second strategy you mentioned, the second video, you're literally just popping up those overlays on the screen saying go to another YouTube video, basically. So you're keeping them in the YouTube environment so it's like a less of a commitment 
and it just feels like you're servicing them and adding more value by by not selling something to them right away by giving them extending the experience through another YouTube video. As precisely, and and we're starting to play around with this idea with documentary type promotions. So it's like. Um, do we go straight to the site and get people to opt in for the documentary or do we just let them have it straight away on YouTube? And do we just like get them to click through and then go through to the first part of the documentary and second part and third part and people engage on YouTube before even going to the site? Um, or let's say, for example, you've got a VSL or a webinar, for example, maybe you can break it up and, and put it into a YouTube experience because I think, I mean, I had this like bit of mini breakthrough. I was coming back from Fiji and I had to book flights with the, for the family. And I was in the air, 35,000 feet above the, the, um, the earth. And I was on my phone booking flights through the Wi-Fi that was available on the, on the flight. And I, I just remember like a year ago, if I was to ever book flights, it would definitely be on my desktop computer. I would have, like, I would never have done it on my mobile. And I would never even imagine buying something in the in middle of the air sort of thing. So I think the world is changing very, very quickly. And I think people are happy to make decisions quicker based on good value. And I think the, I think the lead gen future with the fact that email delivery rates isn't quite as good as what it used to be. And it's like open rates are getting worse and worse over time. Um, I do think there's an argument to say, well, maybe let's say, for example, you're running a webinar uh, or like if you're looking at lead gen or, um, or that type of area, then if you think, right, okay, well, if you're running a webinar, you might have like a 25 to 30% opt-in rate or a webinar registration rate. And then like maybe a, a 30% show rate. That's like great numbers for some people. Mm -hmm. um, what about like, and, and let's say, for example, your click-through rate is at 1.5% of impressions to turn to a click. That's a pretty good number as well. So you're dealing with these conversion rates through the funnel. Like, but you think to yourself, well, all I want people to do is just get the great content on the webinar. Like, People have got plenty of time on YouTube already. Why don't we just give it to them there and then? Sure, we don't get the lead on the website, but we're going to get five times as many people watching the actual content we wanted them to watch in the first place. And they can watch it right now and, and in this place right now. And we're testing this at the moment to kind of work out the value of doing that. But I think if you give people the experience they want on YouTube, it's not going to stop them from making a purchase immediately from YouTube. I, th I My gut feel is that like you just give the content right up front and get them to click through to the site. And I think that might just change the game for how we market online, but that's something we're exploring now. And that's kind of, um, we're, we're, we're yet to, we've got like the nice theory in place. We've got to get, apply yeah. it and get the numbers through the funnel first, but it's a really interesting area for us to be exploring. You know, YouTube wants that, you know, YouTube wants as much of that experience to happen on their site as possible. And yeah. uh, I'm sure that they, you know, if you're spending uh, as much as you are, I'm sure they're, I'm sure they're taking note a little bit. What are some of them? I just, we, I want to wrap this up in a little bit, but I'm curious, like you've been doing this since you've been on YouTube. You've been uh, the YouTube guy now since like 2014 or 2015. I was looking back oh. doing some research. Yeah, probably a little bit earlier than that, but yeah. Even I, earlier than that, which is, which is amazing. Now, what are, what are the biggest developments that have happened in the past like couple years, you said it's changed so much, changing all the time. And then what are you most looking forward to other than, uh, you know, what you just described regarding webinars uh, mm -hmm. with, with the technology? So I'm getting really excited about, um, oh, I think the biggest change that's happened recently is machine learning. That's mm -hmm. like huge. I think that's, that's for every platform. I think you're starting to see this a lot more on Facebook and, and YouTube and Google. I think it's all going in that direction. I'm super excited for it. I think it's scary from, some perspectives because it it means that uh we may not be needed so much <laughs> like humans are just getting in the way of targeting perhaps um i don't think the creative aspect is going to be able to do machine learning anytime soon i think it's going to take a lot longer to get to that point but um i still feel like machine learning is still it's only learning off the data it's already got it's not imagining new things if mm. that makes sense so it might be able to yeah. say oh we've seen other great ads here and we can mash that up to kind of create a different type of ad but it's never going to go from like zero to one if that makes sense um yeah it's, it's always going to have that that leap is going to be where the human brain comes into play um, i know some ai experts even doubt that but that's a scary thought as well um so i think the machine learning is the is the big thing i think that that's kind of where the the, the biggest future lies i think youtube's really cool now because with the it used to be just like horrible ways of clicking from a YouTube ad to a website, but now it's just really clean. You see the white bar, mm. white bars with the blue buttons in them. That's just a lot cleaner and a lot, lot easier to see how that works. Um, and in terms of YouTube, I, I feel like the the future of YouTube is just these experiences that you can build. Like mm. 
you've got like the, uh, the like survey options, uh, like like a Ryan Levesque type funnel um, that are insanely powerful for like asking people what they want and applying that to YouTube, just saying like, hey, how can I help you? Like, like you choose where we go next. And based on that interaction, um, I can give you what you actually want right now in this moment. Um, so that goes for like, let's say for example, a doctor, someone's got arm pain, for example, you say, okay, it sounds like, it looks like you're in pain right now. What part of your body are you experiencing pain in? And you say, click this arm, like you click the arm in the ad, for example. So, okay, cool. So you've got a problem with your arm. What in particular is hurting? Does it hurt when you bend? Is that, so you can like, with about four or five questions, like a doctor would do, they'll be able to kind of get to the point really, really quickly and immediately be able to diagnose a problem as to say, okay, you need to take this sort of action or you need to come and see us or here's what you need to do. Um, mm. And you can like, you could do so many different campaigns like that. Like, hey, let's work out why your marketing's not working as well as you want it to. And just ask the right questions that decision trees and give really good experiences based off the back of that. And so people just fall in love with your brand immediately. And um, it's not gonna be easy to build out, but it's definitely gonna really impact people's lives. And I feel like that is the new, Kind of opportunity for what's happening on youtube and the amount of data that's generated from that process is it's, it's funny i'm i'm working on a, on a lead generation venture right now and i'm going to be picking your brain in barcelona for sure <laughs> um but uh but yeah that idea of building rich experiences maxwell finn was just speaking about it on a live yesterday uh about all the different ways they're getting in front of people with super engaging content and then funneling them into the actions that make sense uh, I really agree that it's the future because people people are in these places for content. They're not the, in these places to be sold. They're in these places to explore, to have problems solved. And the more that your marketing can, yeah, really be along those lines, the, the better it's going to work for sure. And the more yeah, we can change right. the world for the better, Tom, which is what we're all about here in the digital marketing world. Uh, no, it's it's about meeting amazing people like you and uh, and having these awesome conversations. I can't wait to continue the conversation in Barcelona go to iStack.link slash ad buyers right now. Uh, and I really can't, yeah, I, ho I hope ad buyers are well represented in, in Barcelona this year. And Tom, I will see you there. If people want to get in touch with you, first of all, if anyone has any questions, make sure you leave them on this thread. Tom will make sure to come by and, uh, and answer uh, as, as people have any questions. And then, uh, yeah, I'm, I, I can't wait for Barcelona. We'll see you there. And, and if people do want to get in touch with you outside of that, what's the best way? Uh, the best thing to do is just reach out to me on Facebook. It's Tom Breeze. It's a pretty easy one. Um, if you've got like individual questions you want to ask, um, if you have like, I don't know, I'm on viewability.co.uk and tombreeze.com. Those are two other platforms. Um, so that's our agency site and then more of my personal brand stuff. But um, yeah, just normally easy just to reach out to me on Facebook and uh, just ping me a message and start a conversation. Cool. Well, that's what we aim to do with our customers as well. Thanks again for coming on the Robust Marketer today. Uh, will Tom be at Tim Bird's Mastermind that week? I don't know. We'd have to ask Tim about. Are you, are you planning on being at Tim Bird's Mastermind? So he's going. Is, is Ibiza right? Is that the one that's coming up? Well, he has a mastermind before the event. He has a mastermind, I believe, that is on the uh, I don't know, like the sixth and the seventh, maybe. I, and then he's got a, a retreat in Ibiza afterwards, which I highly I recommend both of them. But I definitely recommend you come to the retreat. Well, I'm about to have my third kid, so I need to get all my traveling in now before the third kid comes along. So I'll have a chat with I'll have a chat with Tim and uh, see what the dates look like. And yeah, that would be cool. I'd love to come and hang out. I was just hanging out with him in Fiji, actually. So that was fun. Nice. Well, you can call it your baby stag. I'm trying to make this catch on. I need all my <laughs> yeah. friends are married now, so I need them to start having baby, you know, more baby stags. That's a uh, great yeah. idea. Yeah. yeah. So see if we can make that one go. Perfect. Oh, I'm up for that. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> Cheers, Tom. We'll talk again soon. Good stuff. See you soon. Okay, bye.